very glad to be here and thankful for the very kind welcome of the believers. Trust the Lord's blessing will be granted to us over the weekend. When our brother met me at the airport yesterday, he told me that uh, just just one minute before the plane, the scheduled time for landing, it came on heavy rain and that there were forecasts of thunderstorms. So I wasn't sure whether that was an ill omen for me or an ill omen for you, but here we are anyway, and we'll have to make the best of it. Now, we'd like to read from the Gospel according to Mark and chapter number 4. Mark's Gospel and chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, and we'll read at verse number 34. But without a parable spake he not unto them, and when they were alone he expounded all things to his disciples. And the same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him, even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow, and they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now, some verses from chapter 6 of the same gospel. Mark's gospel, chapter 6. And we read at verse number 46. And straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida, while he sent away the people. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when he was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone upon, alone on the land. And he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit, and cried out, for they all saw him, and were troubled. And immediately he talked with them, and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And he went up unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased. And they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure, and wondered, for they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. Now that's as much as we'll read from the scriptures just for the present meeting. I think we all have been long since impressed by the fact that God is a God of order. The order can particularly be seen in the very intricate designs of creation. Whether we think of the beauty and the structure of the stellar world or the solar world, whether we think of the irreducible complexities of the human being, whether we think of the beauty of the bird world, the structure of the bird wing, the pattern of migratory flights, whether we think of the color, the smell, and the texture of flowers and the plant world, in every different part of creation, the fingerprints of the great designer have been left indelibly impressed. Not only has God left the marks of design upon the book of nature, but he has also left the impression of the same design upon the great book of inspiration. No matter what part of the Bible we turn to, we can see that there is a place for everything, and everything is in its place, and the design of the multi-pieces -piece of Scripture leaves everyone impressed so that we can exclaim, just as we sang a minute ago, Great God of Wonders. There is scarcely any part of the Scripture where this design is more obvious than in the Gospel according to Mark. 
That is a design that hasn't always been noticed. Many have often pointed out the dispensational order of the gospel by Matthew. Many have pointed out the moral order of the gospel according to Luke. Many have pointed out the theological order, the gospel according to John. It has often been thought that Mark is just the pure, simple, unstructured, historical gospel. Now it is historical and it is biographical, but I think the more we read this brief gospel, the more we are impressed that even here, the Holy Spirit, through the instrumentality of John Mark, has given to us a book of the most careful order and design. I think perhaps on a previous visit here, we spent a little bit of time speaking about some of the, what we christened then, the sandwich stories of Mark's gospel, and I thought it might be appropriate just to move on from there. And we may overlap, I don't remember what was said at that time. Some of the ground might be covered slightly again, but I hope we'll be able to break into new ground. One of the, the literary features that impresses even a simple reader of the gospel according to Mark, going no further than the first chapter, is that Mark has a particular habit of repeating something. For example, he says, at even, when the sun was set. What do you say if it was even? Sure, the sun was bound to be set. Well, more or less. He will tell us in the cleansing of the leper that the leprosy departed from him and he was cleansed. But you say if the leprosy departed from him, sure he was bound to be cleansed. Yes, but there is a repetition with particular emphasis. He tells us that the Lord Jesus couldn't come into the cities, but he was without in the uninhabited places. Well, you say, if he wasn't in the city and he was without, well, the without was bound to be uninhabited. But just in case we miss the point, Mark is very careful to double up on his emphasis and he will say he was without in the desert places. Later on in the gospel, when he talk about that lady who put so bountifully into the treasury, he will tell us that she cast in all her living even all that she had. Well, if she cast in all her living, it was bound to be all that she had. But you see, there's another technique. It's a doubling up of something that almost has been said already. But if there is repetition, it's not just vain repetition. And we will discover, I hope in the few sessions over the weekend, we will discover that quite often as we go through Mark's gospel, there are things repeated repeated and repeated again so that the point is being made in various contexts. Now, what I want to do this afternoon, we've started off with a very, very well-known story. Uh, two stories. It will be a lot more difficult tonight, so don't eat too much at your supper. You'll need all the blood going to the brain, and I will need it as well. But we're going to start off with things just nice and simple, and then it'll get a wee bit more complicated tonight. We'll go back to something more simple tomorrow, and then I don't know just how we'll finish up on Monday night, but we'll wait and see. So we're going to look just now at what I've called a triplet. A, 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 a twin or a double, these two stories each to do with the Sea of Galilee, a straightforward double story, one of Mark's twins. Then tonight we're going to look at a doublet in the middle of a triplet. Tomorrow afternoon in the will of the Lord, we'll take a look at a straightforward triplet and if we survive until Monday evening and you survive, we'll take a look at a triplet in the middle of a doublet. Now, the mental arithmetic, if it doesn't do you any good, it'll maybe help me to get over the jet lag so that there might be some benefit in it before the thing is through. A doublet, now. A doublet inside a triplet, later this evening. Tomorrow, a straightforward triplet, and then on Monday evening, a triplet inside 
a doublet. So that you can see, before we go any further, that certainly Mark's gospel is a gospel of very, very clear order and structure. Now, just to leave all those kind of things presently, not to worry too much more about them, maybe I should say, as well as brevity and beauty in this gospel, there's an unusual balance. If you take the baptism of the Lord Jesus and you take Mark's account of his crucifixion, there is a close coordination of those two events, and they're just recorded. I mean, the, the actual death of the Lord Jesus, as well as his baptism, the two things are closely coordinated uh, in Mark's language. At his baptism, he tells us, when the Lord Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were opened, and the voice of the Father said, Thou art my beloved Son, and so on. Now, the strange thing in Mark's account is this, that the word that he uses for open is a most unusual word. The only other time that he uses it in the Gospels, in his Gospel, is at the death of the Lord Jesus. He tells us that the Lord Jesus cried with a loud voice and he expired. He gave out the Spirit. The veil of the temple was rent in twain. Now, that word rent is the very same as the word open at the start of his gospel, at the baptism. He tells us when the Lord Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were rent. When the Lord Jesus expired upon Golgotha, the veil of the temple was rent. It's totally different. Luke says the heavens were opened. Matthew says they were opened. But they use a totally different word. Now, the folks, when you're coming through that door this evening, I have already seen the door. It has opened quite a number of times. Just the normal, natural opening. But if there was someone came to that door now in a frenzy and just burst through, crashed through with violence, that would be the kind of word that Mark uses. He tells us that when the Lord Jesus came up off the waters of baptism, the heavens, the heavens were just burst asunder. It, it nearly seems to me, I may be reading too much into it, it nearly seems to me as if God couldn't wait any longer. And he had looked upon the obedience of his son. And the submissive servant had gone beneath the waters of baptism in unhesitating obedience. And as soon as he came up, God couldn't be, And he just burst. He said, there's something I want to tell you. I'll have to tell you. And he burst out. He said, listen, thou art my son in whom I am well pleased. When the Savior died, it wasn't now the heavens burst asunder. It was the veil in the temple was burst asunder. On the first time, it was God coming out to man. God bursts the heavens and he comes out because he has something that he wants to say and he cannot hold it any longer. He must get it out. God coming out to man. At the end of the gospel, it is man getting into God. And the veil of the temple has been rent in the death of the Lord Jesus. Now, just another two little things, for I can't stay with this at all, but it's just to try and show some who are theologically minded an interest in the balance of Mark's gospel. At the baptism, it says the Holy Spirit came down. At the death of the Lord Jesus at Calvary, Mark tells us that he cried out with a loud voice and he gave out the Spirit. At the baptism, the divine Spirit descended from heaven to earth. At Golgotha, the human Spirit ascended from earth to heaven. When that happened at the baptism, God said, this is my son. There was a rending. There was a movement of the spirit. There was a confession that this is my son or thou art my son. What about the other end? The veil was rent. Jesus gave up the spirit. And the centurion standing by the cross said, Truly this man was the son of of God. So the three things that happened at the baptism were just almost repeated 
item for item when the Lord Jesus expired upon the cross. Now that's just the kind of balance that constantly is appearing in Mark's gospel. Now these two storms. As I say, they're well known, and we'll just try this afternoon to learn one or two very, very simple practical lessons. It's mentioned by every dear brother who speaks on any, either of these passages of Scripture that on each occasion, and this will be important for tonight as well, I'll be making a different thing of it tonight, but just for the present practical, the practical observation, on each occasion the Lord Jesus told the disciples to get into the boat. In the second one it says that he constrained them. In the first one it says that he told the disciples, let us pass over onto the other side. And yet, even though they had the word of Christ for what they did, when they were on the journey, each time, they encountered unexpected difficulty. Now, especially when a person gets saved and the joy of salvation vibrates in their souls, very often the young believer can have in his mind the idea, now I'm saved, my sins are forgiven, I'm on the way to glory, and it will just be plain sailing from here on. If I do what the Lord tells me, if I seek to respond to his word, if I seek to obey his commandments, everything will just go fair. The surface of the sea will be always calm. The sky will be always blue. The sun will be always shining. A young believer could naively have that in his heart and mind. But here are two passages of scripture. Two groups of men, they both get onto the boat. They go onto the sea because Christ told them and they get into difficulty. Well, dear brethren and sisters, especially those that are young, just let me say again for these older believers, I see in the meeting today older Christians, and when it comes to preaching about storms, I'm a little bit embarrassed because I know that there are weathered and experienced sailors in this meeting and they've encountered greater storms than I have and perhaps ever will. And it's embarrassing for me to have to stand in front of them. But just now for the sake of those who may be younger, you do the word of Christ. You obey the commandments of Christ. But please remember that obedience to Christ does not guarantee a trouble-free life. There could be a Christian has made his or her way to the meeting this afternoon and as far as you know, you're not claiming perfection or anything like it, but as far as you know, you have been conscientious in doing what the Lord required you to do and you've done your best with humility of mind to walk humbly with the Lord and maybe just in your life this very Saturday afternoon, there are unexpected storms. And you begin to ask yourself the question, why has it come like this? What has happened? What's the purpose in all this? I thought that if I would go like this and follow the Lord, there would be no problems. Well, there were men had it before. And we need not be surprised that trials will come. Sometimes storms can be the result of disobedience. We know that from other scriptures, but storms can still come even when there is obedience. You say, well, if the Lord sent these men through a storm, okay. Why did he send them through two? Would one, have, would one not have been enough? What was the great point in a repetition? Now, you see, this is part of our lesson. This will grow bigger, I hope, as the few meetings go on. We have two difficult situations on the Sea of Galilee. On the face of it, looking at the things from a distance, they seem to be just like more or less repetitions. But when we take a fairly close look at them, they're anything but repetitions. Now, one of the things that is very important is this. The second experience was more difficult than the first. <laughs> they were both difficult. But the first time that the Lord let these men through the experience, I know he was sleeping, but at least he was there. He was asleep on a cushion in the boat. But the second time he wasn't there. I knew he was watching. They didn't know that, but he was up on the mount and they were talking. Now, he first of all let them pass through a storm when he was with them. 
And he said, okay, boys, you've got through classroom number one. And then he let it go for a while, maybe for the better part of a year. And he said, now, gentlemen, go ahead. And he said, I'm going to let you have a storm now this time, and I'll not be with you. So that experience number two was a little bit more demanding than experience number one. I'm very glad that the Lord didn't reverse it. You know, he didn't send them an experience number two without his presence first and then the other one. No, he built the thing up. Maybe older Christians have often told me that the life of faith and the pathway of faith and the voyage of life, if you want to use that language, the voyage of life can often get more difficult as it goes on. Almost going back on what I said a minute or two ago, we would imagine that companionship with Christ will get easier. And you have heard the brethren here on many, many occasions talk about Abraham and the problems that he had at the start. And then the greater problems that came on later. And then the greater problems that came later still. You see, the Lord doesn't like his pupils always to stay in the same classroom. And he does give them examination. And then after a while, he'll give them an even greater examination and a greater one still because these examinations are being set for their education. And there was a development in the difficulty. Maybe, maybe a believer here today, and you look back or say two years ago when I was here, you say things weren't so bad. And I'd got through one or two little storms and I thought that I was becoming a fairly good accomplished sailor and that I was getting to know the Lord and that I was going on from strength to strength and I thought that the training was almost over. Maybe today you've been landed into greater problems. Well, dear brethren and sisters, don't despair because the Lord does give his pupils more difficult examinations. But he grades it. And no temptation comes beyond what you're able to bear. Now, another thing that I want to mention, just in connection with both of these situations, they were quite, the problem was quite different. What was quite different. And what was even, what the disciples didn't know at the time, the reason for each experience was different. Now, that first experience, you remember chapter 4, I am now, the Lord Jesus had been preaching to them for a whole day. He had been speaking unto them in parables. Then he brought them into the house. And the Bible tells us that in the house, he expounded everything unto them. And I tell you, that was a well worthwhile ministry meeting. It was just great. And these men were listening to Christ and they were hearing from the lips of the Lord Jesus some of the mysteries of the kingdom and there were secrets being disclosed to these men that no one else on earth had ever known before and they had a mighty and a marvelous day of ministry. Just when the day is over, the Lord said, look men, we'll go over to the other side. And the storm came. You say, what was the point of the Lord bringing the men through that experience? Well, you know, it was all part of the education. It was all part of that day's teaching. In the earlier part of the day, if you want to put it this way, they had been students. But now they're going to be sailors. In the early part of the day, they had been enjoying exposition. But in this part of the day, they're going to know something about experience. In the early part of the day, they had been listening to marvelous teaching. Now they're going to go through a tempest. You see, it's great to come to meetings like this. And I'm sure every one of us here has had the experience of being in ministry meetings where very able brethren were able to come. And we just sat at their feet spellbound. And we listen to their unfoldings of Holy Scripture. And we listen to their great expositions of the kingdom of God. And our hearts were absolutely thrilled. You know, if Christianity only involved sitting in ministry meetings, it would be marvelous. 
If the be all and the end all of Christianity was just listening to teaching, it would be absolutely great. But the men had been taught. The Savior says, get onto the boat now. And he says, we'll see how it works out. He says, we'll put you through a test and see how the teaching really is appreciated in your heart. And I'm afraid, brethren and sisters, we have to acknowledge that, that the Lord does that with us. You know, it's all right to give ministry. But the dear brethren who have given a lot of it, they would tell you, indeed one brother told me, and I don't even want you to think about who he is, that's irrelevant. He told me that he had spent much of his time seeking to comfort the Lord's people. And he had many letters expressing appreciation for the comfort that people in trouble had received through his ministry. But he said, there came a day when the Lord took my wife suddenly from my side. And he said, David, I discover. He said, I discover. And he said, I acknowledge it to my shame. If the Lord was pleased to bless the ministry to others, glory be to his name. He said, I discovered that much of what I was saying to others was theory. But he said, when the Lord put me into the storm myself, he said, theory became translated into experience. Now, that's what the Lord did with these men. A day of teaching, but he said, you better get out. It was for their good. It was for their advantage. Even though it was a very difficult experience, well, behind it all, there was the wise design of his loving heart. What about the second experience? Was it for teaching? Not altogether, although there was teaching element in it, of course. But the main purpose of the second storm was for not the men's education, but for their preservation. You see, it took place just after the feeding of the 5,000. I would like to have been there that day. Things were going well. There never had been a crowd like it. The place, the place was just filled with people, no matter where you looked. And the men had been going round with the baskets, and it was just, just a marvelous experience of euphoria and excitement and popular. And when it was over, the people said, "Oh, this is the prophet. We are going to make Christ king." And things were never just as popular before. They were right on the crest of the wave of popularity. The Lord said, "Oh, he says." He said, Thus, he said, it's not good for these men. He says, too much of this success could injure them. Too much of this euphoria, too much of this excitement. He said, I'll tell you what I'll do, men. He said, get on the boat. He said, I'm going up to the mountain to pray. And he sent away. He said, you men, get on the boat. And the men who had been enjoying all unparalleled success. Within a few hours, they found themselves submerged in a very, very difficult storm. And the Lord used the storm to balance the success. You know, after every triumph, there'll be a triumph. After the victory, there'll be a valley. After the storm, after success, there'll be a storm. The first experience was for their education that it wasn't just theory. The second experience was for their preservation. And I know it's not easy. It's maybe easy for a novice sailor like myself to say this. But in real life, it's not easy. But maybe, dear brethren and sisters, when we get to glory, we will from the lens of eternity be able to look back upon our lives and see that some of the most difficult experiences were really for our good. If we always had the wind in our back, if we always had favorable circumstances, if we had too much success, only God knows where we might finish so that he does send trials to temper what otherwise might be very, very injurious to us. Now, to come to another point very, very quickly. The two experiences, I've pointed out some similarities, some differences between them. One was a grade up on the other. But what I want to mention now is this, that the two experiences were 
quite different when you look closely at them. On the first time, it tells us that when these men went out in the evening into the dark, it was the darkness that uh, acerbated the difficulty. But they were out in the evening and it said that there was a, a great storm arose in the lake. Now, I like what Mr. I think it's Mr. Darby, if my memory serves me right, on this particular passage. Instead of a great storm arising on the lake, he says there was a violent gust of wind. I like that. Matthew's gospel tells us that the sea was troubled. Mr. Darby says about Matthew's gospel, the parallel passage to Mark 4, he said the water became very agitated. So that the picture is something like this. These men, in obedience to the word of Christ, they get on their little vessel. The Lord Jesus quickly falls asleep. The sea is just as calm as they would wish for. Suddenly, as if out of nowhere, there came down upon the lake a violent gust of wind, and the little vessel was just caught in an unexpected upheaval. The waters became choppy, Matthew tells us that the boat was covered with waves. Now that doesn't mean that the, the waves got over the top of the boat. If the boat had been covered with waves, the boat would have gone down. Well, you say you have having good theology for the Lord was on board. Well, please forgive me. I'm just talking very... It, doesn't, it means the waves were so big that the boat actually went down. And if you had been standing on the shore, you saw this little boat and then the big wave came and the boat disappeared and it was covered from sight. Not covered by the waves, covered over by water, but it was covered from sight. The waves and the big troughs and, the, well, you know, maybe, maybe there's a believer here today and your little boat's bouncing about. Maybe you could remember, if you were telling me your little life story, a day when you got up in the morning and you had your little time of reading and you had your little time of prayer. You commended yourself and your family to the Lord. You went out upon the day. You thought that everything was reasonably calm and fair, just like any other day. And maybe before that day was over, you were just submerged in the midst of an awful storm. I don't need to come away here to tell the dear believers how quickly things can change. They tell me, those who are interested in the geography of it, that it works something like this. The Sea of Galilee is whatever 680 feet or whatever it is below sea level so it's well down it's surrounded by hills and valleys because it's in this dish with the hot the clear days the sun the air in this dish just where the water is it becomes very warm it's not an uncommon thing at night for the air to begin to rise and rise quite quickly and there's colder air comes down the valleys from the hills in a kind of a funnel. And that colder air is rushing into the vacuum created by the rising hot air. And coming down the funnel of the valleys, it is turned into a spiral movement. And when it comes onto the sea, any little vessel can be caught unexpectedly. Maybe it's the turmoil of unemployment. Maybe there's a brother in the meeting here today and your little vessel has been caught with redundancy. Maybe there's a sister and the last tests at the hospital that you had to have have turned out very negative. Maybe it's someone here, unexpected bereavement has come and upon the sea of life, one day it was calm and within a short space of time, as Mr. Darby says in Matthew, the water in your life has become very agitated. Now, do you see the problem? That was a difficulty. Storms do come and difficulties can arise. And the poor disciples thought that they were going to go down altogether. They said, we'll never get up. Master, carest thou not that we perish? I'll mention that. In a but they were going up and they were going down and coming. And then a big down again. I would think there's hardly a Christian here. And there haven't been times in your life that you thought you were going down. And other times you came up a bit and then away down again. You see, life is like that even though we might wish it otherwise. What about the second storm? Was it a big violent gust of wind? No. No, no. <coughs> Were the waves covering the boat on the second storm? No. 
Was the water all agitated in the sea? Well, there were waves, but I don't think it was half as bad as the first time. You see, what happened the second time? Well, the Bible tells us that they were rowing. And indeed, it tells us that they were toiling and rowing. Actually, actually, that word toiling and rowing, toiling, is the very same word as Luke 16, I am tormented. It, it's a word that indicates exceeding pain. And these men were toiling and rowing. They were tormenting themselves, experienced sailors on Galilee, and they were toiling and rowing. And you say, what was really the problem? It says that the wind was contrary to them. And even though they were rowing with maximum strength, they were making very, very little headway. Now, you see, that's different. The first time the trouble was so great that the men thought they were in danger of perishing. But the second time, the wind was so much against them that the men were finding difficulty in making progress. I can just picture it in my mind. The Savior's not with them now. He has gone up to the mountain. And the men are there after the great day of success, feeding the 5,000, going around with the baskets, giving out the loaves and the fishes, and all that I've talked about a minute or two ago. And now they're in, and they're working their very best. And they take a glance back, and the shore that they've left just back there, it seems only a furlong or two. And they're rowing again, and they're at it for another hour. And they look back. And the shore is just about the same distance. And they go at it again. Now, it's not that they're going to sink. That was the first time. Oh, we're going to sink. They didn't think they were sinking the second time, but it was just they couldn't get on. You know, sometimes serving the Lord in whatever sphere, it brings danger. That's the first story. Very often it's just difficulty. And somebody embarks upon a course that the Lord tells them, I don't know why I'll only throw out a bow at a venture. Many a man has gone to the mission field. And I'll not be criticizing anybody that goes there too much because it's a thing that I have never done. So I need to be very cautious. Many a man has gone, prayed, agonized, absolutely convinced that's where the Lord wants me to go. And he maybe goes. Hudson Taylor went to China, Kerry to India, and those men toiled and toiled and toiled and toiled, and after years hadn't a thing to show. Maybe as a brother in this meeting started out in a Sunday school class work. You prayed about it, you were convinced the Lord wanted you to do that. Maybe it's a couple started out on marriage. You are convinced it was the Lord's mind. Maybe today you're toiling and rowing and things are not, and you're not making progress on something. Else. Maybe it's a brother. He agreed with exercise, encouragement from the Holy Spirit. He agreed to take responsibility in the assembly and sure oversight. What a heavy burden. Maybe just today he's with the other brethren in the boat and they're struggling and they're toiling and it breaks sweat and there's many a sleepless night. And the problem is that we're not making very much headway. The Lord told these men, he wanted to teach these men he said, if you do what I tell you, he said, there'll be days when you'll be in great danger. That's story number one. He said, if you do what I tell you and you serve according to my directions he said, there'll be days when you'll be in great difficulty and it will be hard to go on. That's story number two. Maybe there's a brother, sister, whatever in the meeting today and the wind that's against you the wind was contrary to them. Maybe it's the wind of criticism. You know, it's one great advantage. One thing I would encourage everybody here, if you want to avoid criticism, criticism take up preaching. I, as far as I know, preachers never get any criticism. That's one of the great perks of the platform. You just live a life that's absolutely free from examination. And everybody smiles at your face and shakes your hand and then puts a dagger in your back when you're just about out in the parking lot or so. Well, it's not just as bad as that. Sure it's not. I hope not. I hope not. No, no. But you can get criticism. The wind of criticism. And mind you, it can have a very icy blast. 
This was a northeasterly wind that was coming funneled down from that direction and it was making progress difficult. Maybe a Christian here today and the icy blast of misrepresentation is blowing in your face and it has chilled your soul. Maybe someone else is just discouragement. Maybe a believer here, you did get married, as I say. A little family came along. You have done the best to bring them up in the fear and nurture of the Lord. Maybe things have gone to pieces. Family discouragement and disgrace. I'm not making excuses for it. Family discouragement and disgrace. And the wind is blowing in your face. You know, I'll say for these men, there's one thing about them. <laughs> they weren't making much headway. They were finding the going very tough. Their strength was waning. But as I read the little paragraph, I would say to their credit that I cannot even find the slightest hint of a whimper that they ever discussed changing direction. The Savior said, go across unto Bethsaida. Now you know, you know, if they just had said, oh, boy, sure, that's desperate. We're afraid the master has made a mistake this time. If they just turned around and changed direction, man, they would have been flying. The wind would have been behind them. Many an assembly. Now listen, listen, I want to be stern. The Lord has given us directions as to how we should chart the course of assembly life. We are making our way in testimony through across a sea where the waters have been muddied and are very difficult. Dear brethren and sisters, let me say, progress will be hard. But remember, we have no mandate to change direction. And we have no mandate to jump ship. Nothing like that. These men just kept going. And not only did they not turn around, but they never even thought of tacking or turning. When the Savior came to them, they were just in the very direction that he had appointed. And that was something surely to their credit. Well, I'll speak about the next point just quickly. Because it brings both stories together. And I've been guilty of it already today. And... You know, one of the things that aggravated the problem in each case was the delay. The Savior did act. Blessed be his name. I can't go into that. I'm going to stop at five o'clock. But you know, there was the first time the Savior's sleeping. And the water was beginning to come into the boat. Now, it wasn't covered with waves and water, as I've said. But it tells us that the boat was now full. You need to watch the revised version there. It says the boat was now filling. The boat wasn't full, but it was filling. Some of the water was beginning to get over, and the boat was now filling. <laughs> I can nearly get the exasperation there. It's getting to the point of crisis. It's, we, 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 it's getting the better of us, and the Lord's still sleeping. Why doesn't the Lord get up and do something? The men are getting frustrated. You know... There is nothing in life, I suppose, for most of the Lord's people as difficult that at times we are allowed into trials. And the Lord allows us to go without help until almost breaking point. And we would wonder why he allows it to go so far and why he waits so long. The story of John 11 and 12. What about the second story? It says they were toiling and rowing. They made very little headway. The wind was contrary and the Lord came to them about three o'clock in the morning. Not even as early as that. He waited until the fourth watch of the night. Oh, you say that was cruel. Why did he not intervene sooner? Well, you see, the Lord does that. Maybe a brother or sister in, in the little boat of testimony, maybe sailing on the voyage of life, and you're just, according to the language of Psalm 107, you're just about at your wit's end. They are at their wit's end. Then they cry unto the Lord. You know, the thing had gone so far that when the Lord did intervene, I think these men appreciated him all the more, or at least they should have. Patience. Patience can be a difficulty. 
We sometimes give way to the actings of the flesh. Waiting for God is withering to the flesh. But it's very wholesome and strengthening for the spirit. The one thing, of course, that really changed both situations was the Lord came and he spoke a word. In that first storm, and I'm skipping a bit now, in the first storm, when eventually they did raise him, the fear of their hearts, emotions. Oh, I would love to spend a while on that, but I can't do it today. You know, emotions can carry a believer away. They got so afraid and they panicked. They panicked and they said, Lord, Lord, do you not care? You see, their emotions took over from their faith. They really knew that the Lord cared. They really knew in, in their systematic theology, page 197, paragraph 3, they knew that the Lord wouldn't let them perish. They knew that they had read all the systematic theologies. They had listened to a day of preaching, marvelous teaching about the kingdom. These men were miniature theologians, nearly as good as us. They knew all this stuff, but then their emotions, and they panicked, and they said, Lord, are we going to perish? You see, fear took over from faith, and then they started to talk nonsense. What about the second story? They were afraid, and the Lord came, and he was close to the boat, and they suppose. They suppose. And they allowed the reasonings of their natural mind to take over again. And their supposition, fear and supposition, it drove these men into, well, a very, very inconsistent. You know, dear brother, sister, I'm jumping from this. You be very, very careful that you don't let your life be run by your emotion. Now, we cannot deny our emotions. Emotions play a big part in the Christian's experience. But he needs to watch emotions very, very carefully but the word of Christ on the second storm he said it is I in the first storm he said peace be still and it was just his word not the same word no he doesn't repeat himself but it was just his word on each occasion that was the solution to the problem I love it says about the second one he saw them toiling and he came unto them in the fourth watch of the night and when he was still outside the boat it says he talked with them not lovely he talked with them I would know that I'm looking on seasoned believers here today and there have been times when you would tell me if I was again going over the story of your little life you could say there were days of darkness there were days of storm and there were days of difficulty but in those very experiences I enjoyed the word of the Lord more sweetly than in the better days of life he talked with them and he said, peace be still. It has surprised me how many times I have gone to hospital to visit believers in storms and in trials. And you have heard others talk about it a thousand times. And they say, I went to see so-and-so and, you know, I came away with a blessing. And you try to read a psalm. Or you try to read a little piece from Romans 8 or Isaiah and you certainly did your very best and before you finished they said to you, they said you know I was enjoying a wee verse yesterday just before I went for the operation and they got a word from Christ that calmed the storm that made the difficulties seem much lesser. May God help us all to have ears just to be willing to listen to his word. Now as I, just before we pray I would need to say this just to be theologically respectable before the meeting is over. The problem was solved quite differently. You know that brethren speak about the dispensational setting of these things. I have avoided that to the maximum this afternoon. On the first occasion, the Lord was there, but he was sleeping, as we have said. <coughs> The problem was solved by the fact that he got up, he rose, and he rebuked the waves. Now that was, a, that was a demonstration to the disciples that you men are going to go into a storm and I'll still be here, but I'll be sleeping. I'll be dead. I'll be dead. And mind you, they did face a storm when he died. 
There were three days that these men were in dreadful turmoil and he was lying not in the boat, he was lying in the tomb and he was dead and he was inactive and the poor disciples were absolutely tempest-tossed. But on the third day he got up and he said, it's all right, peace be unto you when he came into the upper room. The first storm was solved by his resurrection. You say, what about the second storm? How was it solved? The fact that he came back from the mountain. He left them. He went away up to the mountain. He prayed for them and watched them. And then eventually he came back and he rejoined them. The first storm answered by his resurrection. The second storm answered by his return. Dear fellow believers in Stark Road this afternoon, I do not know what storms you have faced or what storms you might yet face, but this I can say. There are two truths. Ever keep them crystallized in the very heart of your faith. Let them be the anchor of your soul. Truth number one is this. Christ arose. He has conquered death and there will never be any storm that will swallow up a saint because Christ arose. Truth number two is this. Christ is returning. And every tempest-driven bark with Jesus as its guide shall soon be moored in harbor calm in glory to abide. Mark's twin storms. I hope there'll be some lesson here that will be a help to us in the experiences of life. Shall we pray?